very much, Mr. Zanny. You know, that chickadee may have followed you because we've got a one-legged chickadee at our house now. <laughs> what a deal. <laughs> Compassion, whether it's a little one-legged chickadee or whatever it may be, it's something that God has called us to show. Let's pray about that. Lord, bless my words that they may help us to focus on your compassion this day and grow in that compassion ourselves. In your name we pray. Amen. So compassion, care, concern for others. We want others to understand the love of God. Uh, learned a little bit about this. I thought a little bit about it as we were recently, Heather and I, having a privilege to do a trip we dreamed of our whole life to go to our 50th and final state. Both of us have traveled all 50 states now with our trip to Hawaii just this last winter. Uh, in the end of January, February, we were there for about 10 days. It was an awesome time. And something we learned about while we were there was this symbol. Anyone ever seen that before? Yeah, and we hear about, we see that, we may say, oh, that's hang loose or whatever. Uh, they call it the shaka symbol, uh, is another name for it. Uh, has various meanings, uh, but in Hawaii, they talk about aloha, or a spirit of peace and friendship, and that we are all one and we get along with each other, and that's what this symbol, they say, kind of stands for that, that we're to care for people, and more than just the peace sign, but this is something deeper of to care and have concern and get along as friends with each other, and it sounds a lot like the kind of compassion that God has for us, that he cares for us, and he wants us to be cool, to be peaceful, to not worry so much about things. Um, he cares for us, and I'm going to use that little symbol because it can tie in with where I'm going to take this message from our readings today. That word compassion is a key word. We heard about Jesus showing that compassion in our gospel lesson for people that were hungry and hurting and in need. And in the second reading, we heard about Paul's compassion for his fellow Jewish people who were destined to an eternity apart from God. And he cared so much he would do anything for them to know the love of God. I've talked before here at Faith about a thumbs-up symbol and putting Jesus first and your spouse and children and family and your church family after that and then caring for everyone else in the world too, keeping our priorities clear where the love of Jesus passes through us as the palm of the hand and goes out to all these people in our lives so that we can hand out God's love to those people around us. The key is to connect that thumb, Jesus, with all of these people. And we are that hinge point that does it. And one of the most important jobs we have on earth now is to connect that love of Jesus with the people of the pinky, is what I say. People who don't yet know Jesus Christ, who are not bound for heaven because they've not heard of him or repented and trusted in him. They are apart from his love. And our job is to make a connection then, back to our Shaka guide, from that thumb over to the pinky. But we talk about from Jesus to everyone in the world around us. To make that connection is what compassion is all about. We care enough to want them with us for all eternity. And so we follow that thumbs up model, shall we say, to take that love and get it out there to the world. Not to keep it closed in on ourselves, but to get it out there to the world. We are to do this because God calls us to care for all these who don't know him. He does not want them to be destined to an eternity apart from him. And sadly, that's the destiny for any who do not have Jesus as their savior. He warns us about that all through scripture. Jesus himself says in Mark 16, verse 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And also he further clarifies in John 3, verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Not someday when Jesus comes back or they die, but already we're in that condemnation. What he's talking about is if we don't know Jesus, our life is going to be filled with sorrow and bitterness and shame and pain that we can't resolve by our power. There's only one answer to that, to that pain that we have because of our sin. That's Jesus. And he wants everyone to have it. He has this compassion that wants us to go out and warn them of the sorrow that awaits if they do not receive Jesus. That is a real genuine concern that Jesus shows in every way. And he calls us to show. 
problem is we are often caught up with a lack of compassion, that we don't care for the hurting people around us. We're so busy wrapped up in our own stuff like this guy on his cell phone, so focused on that that probably doesn't even see the distraught look on the face of the woman in front of him. Maybe this is even someone he's supposed to be related to. I don't know, but isn't that so often the case? We're so focused on ourselves, our busy things, our concerns, our worries, we miss the world around us. We miss those people that don't know Jesus. God calls us to do that. He says, be alert to them. Wake up. Problem is, we're a lot like uh, Pastor Ken Klaus described of uh, himself when he heard the news that uh, the oceans of the world are rising. In fact, some scientists claimed in this article that he read uh, in Cuba that were doing a study that by the end of uh, this century, the waters would rise about 30 inches and a lot of Cuba would be underwater. And at first he said, wow, that's kind of scary. That's pretty awful. And then after a little bit he said, glad I don't live in Cuba. I'm glad I won't be alive by the end of the century. So, oh well, whatever. I can't do much about it, so I go on. That's our natural instinct, isn't it? To say, yeah, I'll do what I can where I can, but most of the time, oh well, I'm glad it's not me. Glad it's not me that's in that hospital or me that had that loved one die or me that's lost every penny to their name. How often do we become focused on me, myself, and I and we forget about the people around us? Don't want to take the time for them because I'm too busy taking care of myself. That is a real problem that creeps in even in the church among good Christian people. I mentioned Sue was just at the synodical convention LCMS convention, a place where you'd think all these wonderful Christian people would be in perfect love and harmony with one another. Everybody's caring for everybody and smiling and hugging and happy. Is that the environment there at the convention, Sue? Not so much. Instead, it's, you vote for my thing. No, you vote for my thing. And don't go for them. Don't vote for that guy. I don't like him. And, and watch out for him. He's trouble. And so much of this political stuff, even in the church, because we get focused on, I want what I want, that I think is best, that I know what's good for these people. And then we look at others, even good fellow believers, as enemies. We lack compassion as Jesus had. The roots of that word, compassion, calm is with being together with them, having a heartfelt passion for others. We lose that. Robert Mulholland is a great Christian writer, and he wrote one time a good illustration of this about a group that missed the focus on what they're to be about, about a group called the Rescue Society, some um, men and women who lived on a rocky coast near some very difficult waters for shipping to navigate, and quite often there'd be shipwrecks near there, and so they formed this rescue society to go out and help people who uh, had floundered on the rocks. And they saved many people over the years, did a great job. And they enjoyed it so much that they said, let's get better and better. And they started to build a nicer place to do their work from. They went to training all the time. They got better and better at what they did because that was what they were good at. And in fact, one night they were away at a conference to learn how to do this rescue work even better with the latest technology. And while they were all away, a large passenger ship struck the reef and started to sink. And they were too far to get there in time. And many hundreds died because they weren't where they were meant to be to do their real work. They're so focused on perfecting their skill and getting it all right for themselves that they missed their real purpose of caring for the dying. Do we do that in the church ever? Do we as individual Christians ever get focused on, I'm going to be the best little Christian I can be, but I don't have compassion for that person driving by who's speeding towards a life of sorrow and destruction apart from Jesus and his love. That's the danger Jesus is warning about. And he says it's quite terrible if we don't have compassion on the hurting people. Someone like this who's filled with all these sins and griefs that are bothering her. Um, she may feel like she's a thief or a robber or someone who's a cheater, or prideful, and all those sins that are weighing so many people down and we don't have compassion on them. It's like seeing a girl walking out into the street and she doesn't see the cars coming and we don't warn her, get out before you get run over, a little young baby girl or something. And that's how we are with sinful people who are 
caught up in all these sins and on their way to destruction. The Lord says, come back and care for these. You have my gifts, now share them. You are forgiven, you are loved, now make it known to those around you with compassion and care. And this image here, I like it because it's showing the grief and sorrow that comes when we are bound up in the sin of the world that's all around. But if you focus in on her arm, what does it say? I am who Christ died for. It's an important point. It's for sinners just like this woman that Jesus died. He went to the cross for every rotten sinner, you and me, and every other one in the world. There is no sin so terrible that Jesus didn't die for it and pay the price for it. There is no one beyond his reach of love, no matter how awful they may look. We are to be the ones who connect his love with that world to bring them his peace. And so he calls us to do that, to reach out in care and concern for all who are around us. As we hear in Acts 2.38, Peter said to those who were gathered around him on uh, Pentecost at that time, he said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say, if you have the right skin color and the right heritage, repent and you might be received. He says, all of you, repent and be baptized, every one of you, his whole audience, all those who are listening, everyone is worthy to receive this gift by simply turning from self and receiving the gift. It's there for all. It's backed up by Jesus himself, as he says in Mark 16, verse 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. He doesn't put a limit on it. Anyone who receives his forgiveness and baptism, who receives his words of love, is saved. We get to pass it on without discrimination of who gets to hear and who doesn't. It's not our job to worry about, well, is that person worthy of it? I don't know. Maybe not, so I shouldn't talk to them. It's not our job. Our job is to te teach the word of truth to everyone everywhere, to love them as Jesus loved everyone. With that compassion that moved him, even as he was exhausted after everything he'd been through, and he got to this shore of the, the other side of the sea, and he cared enough to feed the hungry, to heal the sick, to give them a hope of salvation. This is the love of Jesus that we are to pass along because it is a love that never fails. It will not ever go away, and it will never be insufficient. It will always have enough to go around for everybody, everywhere. Lamentations 3.22, you'd think Lamentations, a book of sorrow and, and grief and woe, but it's also a book that has some beautiful words in it, such as this from chapter 3, verse 22, the steadfast love that we heard about before in the psalm that we read responsively, where it repeats over and over, the steadfast love endures forever. Here in Lamentations, it says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, Lord. New mercy, new blessings, new joy every single morning. That's what we have. We have it all. We've received everything we need. And so now that we have it, we get to share it freely everywhere we go to have that compassion that cares for the hurting individuals around us, for the person in the hospital or nursing home, for the neighbor who's all alone by themselves, for the sinner who thinks there's no way out. We get to share this hope in Jesus Christ to be the ones who pass on his love. That's something that we should never grow tired of, never grow weary in sharing. And we should spend more time focusing on that instead of on our own woes and worries. It's an important point that I want to make here. How often do you wake up in the morning and the first thought in your head is, oh, who do I get to bless today with Jesus' love? Instead is your first thought, oh man, I got to go to the doctor today. Or, oh, no, how am I going to take care of this problem? Oh, so-and-so's still mad at me, I bet. Or, oh, I messed up yesterday, and I should have done this, and I should have done that. Which way are you? If you're like me, 
it's the latter most of the time. The immediate thoughts that come in mind are, woe is me, what have I done wrong, or what's in store that I have to deal with. All the things that are all about me consume me. That's why Jesus says here, be compassionate for the others, as he did. Try to be more like Jesus, to be more like his disciples, instead of worrying about ourselves, to care for others. As Jesus, who was exhausted, yet he still took time for compassion, may God help us to do the same. Because remember, we already have everything we need. We're already forgiven, freely. It's a gift that nothing in this world can take away. We're already on our way to heaven, a joy that will never end. We are already living eternal life with joy and peace and contentment. A peace that passes understanding even through the woes and troubles of life. We have it already. We are wealthy beyond consideration no matter how much money we have in our pocket. We've got the wealth of Jesus' love. And we get to share it for free. What a blessing. And so that is what moves us to go out to this world and reach out in love and say, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me give you his love. Let me take what I've received and give it to you, no matter who you are or where you come from. Ken Klaus, I referred to earlier, as a pastor who spoke on the Lutheran Hour. And he had this neat little thing. He said, you may say, I'm not worthy to do that. Peter or Paul or some of them, they could do it. Pastor, you can do it. I can't do that. He said, try the evangelism technique called the Andrew principle. Andrew was the brother of Simon Peter. And it was Andrew who first heard of Jesus and followed Jesus and believed in him as the Messiah, who then went to his brother Peter and said, we found the Messiah. Come and see. And what did Peter say? Yeah, right. But Andrew didn't give up. He said, come on, you got to hear about this. you got to see this guy. He is the Messiah we've been waiting for. Andrew doesn't say anything about how eloquent he was or how learned he was. He didn't come and go to Peter and say, look at these passages from Scripture that tell that this is the guy. He didn't go through a long exegetical discourse with him from Scripture. He just said, come and see you're my brother and I care about you. Come and see. We can do the same thing. Even if you don't feel worthy as an evangelist or a prophet, you can go to anyone and say, hey, I've got some great stuff I've received. Come and see. I'd like you to come along and hear about it. Come join me. I'll sit with you. Come join me in church next week. It's not that scary of a place. It's awesome. I can't believe how blessed I am. Come and see. God will do the rest. That's his job. Let's joyfully and eagerly go out and make connections from Jesus to those pinky people, the ones who don't not yet know Jesus and his love. As we reach out with Jesus and they come and see and then they hear of Jesus and his love, they too can receive that peace and that comfort and that unity with us that's better than just hang loose. It is hang under the arms of Christ where you are covered with his love. Let us go out and share Jesus with compassion. Amen.